Indians have fished these waters for thousands of years. Their whole lives are centered around these rivers. Their whole life is built around the sand. Their culture is built around their, their art, um, their paintings, their, uh, their storytelling. We've been taught uh, to respect the salmon and uh, how uh, we would uh, take only what uh, we ne our needs were. The salmon understood that we needed part of his life for our life. Indian elders taught their children about the salmon people who lived in houses under the sea. Every year, one of these salmon people would change into a salmon and swim to the fishing ground. The harvested salmon would be ceremoniously carried from the water and prepared so that all members of the tribe could taste the meat and show their deep respect. The first salmon that comes in is a scout for the rest of the salmon. If he's well treated by our people here, he's given a good reception, and we're returning in, back into the waters, and then he will go uh, and tell his uh, salmon people uh, that's still in the water there that he had a very good reception, and he will bring the salmon uh, back for the, our tribe to catch in abundance. And, uh, and uh, the salmon is just as important to our tribe as the uh, air we breathe. Survival of the salmon has always meant more than just food to the Indian people. The Indian has long recognized that if he is to survive, and if his children's children are to survive, it will be because the salmon survives. It is their legacy. Indian tribes lived on every river system in the Pacific Northwest, as well as on the Puget Sound and the coast. They harvested salmon, steelhead, bottom fish, shellfish, and other species of fish life for many centuries before the white man set foot on this land. When Europeans did come, they found indescribably rich fish and wildlife resources. The Indians had always lived in harmony with the land, and it showed. But in the past century, there has been a different story to tell. A story about pollution of fresh and salt water. Of runoff from agricultural activities. And city streets. A story about dams that have clogged fish migration patterns. About water shortages. About overfishing and any number of other problems that have threatened the fish resource. Isaac Stevens, governor of the Washington Territory, brought treaties to the tribes in the 1850s. The whites wanted Indian land for settlement, and they wanted to make Washington a state. In addition to reservations, the treaties contained provisions for the tribes to share their precious fish resources in common with all the citizens of the territory. But when the non-Indians found that the fish and other resources held by the tribes had a high commercial value, they took the same trail blazed by miners, ranchers, and timber barons and chose to ignore the treaty. Fish canneries sprung up throughout the Northwest, and towns sprouted up everywhere as fish harvest and processing dynasties laid personal claim to vast quantities of the fish, paying no attention to the protection of the fish for future generations. Northwest salmon found its way into the marketplaces of the world, and yet the tribes were left with very little. White society had thrust itself into the very heart of Indian country like a giant sledge, and the Indian way of life suffered many losses. Yeah. 
over the years, Indians were driven out of fish management by the state and denied access to a resource they had depended on from time immemorial. Uh, these issues have been in the courts on several occasions, and our courts in this state have held that these Indians have no rights, at least rights of the kind that they assert. With their very survival dependent on the fish, the tribes had no choice but to resist and challenge state authority to regulate Indian fishing. It would take great strength and courage for Indians to survive, but survive they did, and modern America is today witnessing a rebirth of the Northwest Indian way of life. Little wonder that the area is simultaneously witnessing a comeback of its fishery resource. In 1974, a federal judge named George Bolt decided in favor of the tribes in U.S. versus Washington. It was a court case destined to change history. The decision, which was upheld by the United States Supreme Court in 1979, directed the state of Washington to abide by the terms of Indian treaties. The tribes had been permitted to harvest less than 6% of the annual harvestable salmon and steelhead prior to the decision. And now would we'll co-manage the resource and harvest 50%. Another important part of the decision was the confirmation that the treaty right includes a right to a clean and healthy fishery habitat. The treaty right to fish and the right of the fish to survive here were unquestionably now the law of the land. A number of non-Indian fishermen made their dissatisfaction with the decision a matter of public record, as did some state officials. But in time, the state moved to accept the tribes as co-managers of the fisheries resource. The tribes created the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission in 1974 to support their renewed fisheries management efforts. Tribal officials were elected to establish the policy of the Olympia-based commission and to represent the interests of their respective treaty areas. The preamble to the Commission's Constitution reflected the mood for Indian participation in fisheries management for the years to come. We, the Indians of the Pacific Northwest, recognize that our fisheries are a basic and important natural resource and a vital concern to the Indians of this state and that the conservation of this resource is dependent upon effective and progressive management. We further believe that by unity of action, we can best accomplish these things, not only for the benefit of our own people, but for all the people of the Pacific Northwest. Today, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission employs a staff of more than 30 people. About half of these staff members are professional fisheries biologists trained in the same universities as their state counterparts. The commission staff works with the management staffs of each member tribe to manage the fishery resource with state-of-the-art technology in data management, research, habitat management, and interorganizational coordination. In 1984, the state and the tribes ushered in a new era of cooperation. At the policy and technical levels, the Indian and non-Indian fishery managers and staffs put their shoulders to the wheel and produced coordinated harvest plans to restore the fish resources for all fishermen, Indian and non-Indian. We are seizing an opportunity in the Pacific Northwest to prove that people with a common objective can work together regardless of differing viewpoints and backgrounds. We can assure the survival of the Pacific Northwest fish resource through cooperative management. The Indian Treaty fishing right is a valid right. We respect it, we support it. Managing anadromous fish places the interests of Indians and non-Indians alike right at the doorstep of everybody from city planners to farmers. fish have to go through every imaginable ownership to migrate up and downstream. That's one of the reasons we need to be managing on a watershed to watershed basis. The watershed planning process is a logical, coordinated approach to establishing common objectives and seeking specific common solutions to the many fish protection and enhancement challenges we all face.
folks in the timber business have learned to work with the tribal leaders face to face, not through shouting attorneys. We're getting something done. This historic timber fish wildlife agreement. Used to be enemies, now we find we're working together as common managers. We're protecting nature, we're utilizing its gifts, and the neat thing is working in the woods. I encourage all sports fishermen to face the facts. Assuring the long-term survival of the fishery resource is no small task. The Indian and non-Indian, we each need each other. The U.S.-Canada Treaty is a good example of what we can accomplish working together. It took years on all of our parts, hard work, but it was well worth it. The U.S.-Canada Treaty assures us long-term protection and the international interception of Northwest salmon stocks. But the work's not done. Now, there's a lot of work ahead of us. And we, none of us can do it alone. We need to all work together. The tribes are energetic in efforts to restore clean and ample water. They are active in the reintroduction of non-hatchery fish into the systems. They conduct broodstock, habitat rehabilitation, and outplanting projects in watersheds throughout the region. The tribes bring important traditional value to today's resource management, yet they lead the way in the application of computer age technology. The level of the tribe's dedication to hatchery fish enhancement is evidenced by their release of an estimated 50 million healthy young fish into the river systems every year. Fish that are harvested by Indian and non-Indian fishermen, sports and commercial. The tribes collect and analyze information useful to Indian and non-Indian fish managers and biologists throughout the region. They count fish en route to spawning beds. They conduct and analyze fish health and development research and operate an ambitious juvenile fish coated wire tagging program. Two tribally operated coated wire tagging trailers travel from hatchery to hatchery to tag millions of coho, chum, and chinook salmon and steelhead every year. Tiny tags marked with microscopic slices are inserted into the noses of the young fish. Their adipose fins are snipped off for easy identification and upon later retrieval from returning adult fish, the tags provide fish migration, harvest, health and habit information for U.S.-Canada Salmon Treaty implementation and all other aspects of fisheries management. Recent years have provided the tribes a real opportunity to increase their role as contemporary fishery managers. They do not take the role lightly. The simple fact is that the cooperation in fisheries management that has evolved since the Bolt decision has led to increases in protection of the resource to the benefit of Indian and non-Indian alike. The tribes are here to stay as co-managers. They have their technical people in place, their management schemes in place along these watersheds. They have their policy people on every level of the United States and the state government as leaders prepared to take us into the future. We all have a choice. We can respect one another's right and build together. Or we can fight over what would then be a dying resource. We can work together to restore the fish and its habitat. Or we can overfish and pollute the world our children, Indian and non-Indian, will inherit. The choice is yours. Oh,